Hello, everybody, and welcome um, to our webinar today on World Mental Health Day. Um, my name is Laura Ashram. I'm the Chief Executive of the British Neuroscience Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to this special webinar on the relationship between depression and serotonin and what this means for the future of mental health treatments. This webinar is sponsored by Compass Pathways. So we've got a fantastic lineup for you today um, and what I hope will be a very lively discussion. We'd love for you to get involved in that discussion. So if you've got any questions, please do pop those in the Q&A section and we'll pose those to our panelists at the end. Um, I'd like to take you to this opportunity to remind you that this webinar is being recorded with the permission of our speakers and it will be available to watch on demand later on on the BNA's YouTube channel and website. And finally, a reminder to please adhere to the BNA Code of Conduct for webinars and to engage respectfully online. So without further ado, let me introduce you today to our fantastic panel of speakers who will be leading our discussion. We've got Guy Goodwin, Chief Medical Officer for Compass Pathways. He's Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Oxford, completed his medical degree and DPhil in Neurophysiology at the University of Oxford, and following his training in psychiatry, became a clinical scientist and consultant psychiatrist at the MRC Brain Metabolism Unit at the Royal Edinburgh Hospital. Guy's research interests focus on understanding and developing new treatments for mood disorders, and his current interests include the potential to transform treatment using new technology and new drugs, notably psychedelics. We've also got Samir Johar joining us, a senior clinical lecturer in affective disorders and psychosis at the IOPPN, King's College, and a consultant psychiatrist who looks after people with first episode psychosis. His research focuses on molecular imaging in psychiatry, psychopharmacology, and he's received various grants and awards within these fields. David Erizzo is a clinical senior lecturer in, in general psychiatry in Centres for Neuropharmacology and Psychedelic Research at Imperial College London, and a consultant psychiatrist at St Charles's Hospital, where he heads a new NHS-based research clinic. David con conducts psychopharmacological research using brain imaging techniques such as PET and MRI, investigating the neurobiology of addictions and major depression. And last but not least, we're also joined by Beata Godlewska, who is a senior clinical researcher and consultant psychiatrist working at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Oxford. For the past 13 years, she's worked with Phil Cowan, an expert on serotonin, exploring the mechanisms leading to the development of mood disorders and the mechanisms of actions of antidepressant medications, with the ultimate goal being translating this into the development of new treatments for depression. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, I'm really looking forward to a discussion on the history of serotonin and our kind of discoveries um, along the way and what that means for future treatment. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Guy to introduce the topic for us. Thank you, Guy. Thank you very much, Laura. If I could just start with the first slide. So I'm gonna give what, if, if you like, is a historical perspective um, and talk about the origins of serotonin. First, before I do that, just my disclosures on the next slide, please. And then some forward-looking statements, uh, statements about forward-looking statements relate to my role at Compass. And this isn't gonna be very much what I talk about in my particular piece here, but it's important I do that. So serotonin was originally discovered as a chemical. It was often thought of as being a bit, probably a hormone initially in the gut. People tended to think of things that were chemically active within the body as hormones because in those days, in the 1930s, when this was first extracted, there wasn't a very clear understanding that chemical transmission characterized the brain as well as the periphery. So this extract, uh, first described as a smooth muscle constrictor, was identified and it was subsequently discovered to be identical with serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine. The person who was most responsible for, for that characterization was a guy called Irving Page. And Page discovered serotonin because he was just sort of working on other vasoconstrictors that might contribute to hypertension. And serotonin was a nuisance. It got in the way of his assays. And so he has this slightly jaundiced quote, which is great really because it covers <laughs> a rather important human quality. 
which he says the great variety of suggested roles for serotonin can be said to be a tribute to man's ingenuity and his unquestionable willingness to write papers. And this uh, impulse has not gone away. Next slide, please. So serotonin in the brain is a slightly different story. And I think you can, you can trace it back, in fact, to when Hoffman uh, discovered LSD. LSD was the first example uh, identified as a, of a psychedelic drug that was synthesized. Um, but the work that led up to that was conducted also in the 30s with extracts from ergot. And Hoffman came up with LSD, and, and there's many stories told about this, but the key thing is that he ended up taking a dose which he believed to be very low, but actually turned out to be very potent. And he had the first uh, documented psychedelic trip on LSD. And that, of course, was important because it told us two things. It, first of all, it gave us a very clear advance warning that chemical transmission in the brain was a real thing. And it challenged ideas of, our ideas of what might underlie consciousness. And the second thing was it led to the identification of the receptors for LSD with the serotonin, the drug that resembled, structurally resembles LSD itself. And that sort of synthesis came together with Twar Betty Twarog and Page again, Irving Page, who identified serotonin in the brain and in many ways can take credit for having, notwithstanding Page's objections, it became sort of the origins of the of brain chemistry, the idea that you could do chemistry in the brain at all. And that was very quickly taken up. Uh, and the, 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 I refer you to this article by Woolley and Shaw about the same time who seeing the structural similarity of serotonin and LSD and the relating serotonin on the one hand with a known chemistry and LSD with this remarkable effect on consciousness, they put forward the idea that is at the heart of modern controversy when they said, if a def deficiency of serotonin in the central nervous system were to result from metabolic, that is in a sense from disease related rather than pharmacologically induced disturbances, these same mental aberrations would be expected to become manifest. And perhaps such a deficiency is responsible for the natural occurrence of the diseases. So this is the first really specific linkage of serotonin to brain disease, stroke, uh, particularly to psychiatric disease. Next slide, please. Now, we were entering at this point what you might call the monoamine era. There is chemical similarities between a variety of neurotransmitters. They occur at similar concentrations in the brain. It turned out they had interesting uh, anatomically distinct distributions. And the first clear undoubted monoamine deficiency disease was Parkinsonism. And that, that the ideas around that were developed particularly by Hornikiewicz work, working in the 1950s and 1960s. And that led to the very simple but straightforward idea that if you had a deficiency of a brain chemical, then you might be able to treat it by supplying a precursor. In this case, that precursor was L-DOPA, and then the transmitter, of course, was dopamine. So the, the idea was very much current at the time that that could be the same kind of relationship for depression, that the potentiation of an antidepressant by tryptophan might be a possibility, and Alec Coppen who was one of the um, original psychopharmacologists, if you like, did the necessary experiment and suggested just that, that by supplementing a monoamine oxidase inhibitor with the precursor for 5-HT, which is tryptophan, you could improve the outcome in depression. So there, there we were. We were in the monoamine era. We had a link to tryptophan, which was related to treatment. Was there a, was there a relationship to the, the disease? Next, next slide, please. And the obvious question was, what happens if serotonin is depleted from the human brain? And the methods for doing that were developed by giving, first of all, animals and then subsequently people, uh, tryptophan, tryptophan free mixtures of large neutral amino acids. And when you do that, you essentially block access of tryptophan to the brain, either in animals or in man. And by doing that, because tryptophan is the obligate precursor to serotonin and other chemicals, you lower, potentially lower serotonin in the brain. And so that would gave, gave us a mean, an experimental way of lowering serotonin in the human brain and seeing whether that had an impact on depressive symptoms. And these experiments were done, uh, the most notable one, which I'm citing here in 1997, was done by Katie Smith and Phil Cowan in Oxford. 
And they took 15 women who'd recovered from major depression and who were drug free. So a difficult study to do. Um, they then randomized them to either uh, receive the nutritionally bank, bans, balanced mixture or the tryptophan free. Um, there was a crossover, so they always had both. And what you can see is that the tryptophan free mixture had a really quite dramatic effect on their symptoms. And indeed, I think now we'd be rather reluctant uh, ethically to do this experiment because of the effect was so strong and it hasn't been much repeated since. And this was an effect in patients who were not on ser serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I'll come on to that in a moment. This was in people who were on no drugs whatsoever. So you can see that a link was building between tryptophan as a potential deficiency that you could correct or as a chemical that you could deplete and produce a, an effect on, on depression. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, the, the link that, that, we, that we have to then now build is that in the meantime, between the recognition of the, the serotonin um, uh, expression in the brain and, the, and these ideas about depletion of serotonin uh, by, by tryptophan depletion, we had the appearance of reuptake inhibitors, the first antidepressants um, that use that mechanism, and then subsequently the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors built specifically on the idea that there was a unique relationship between depression, tryptophan, uh, the serotonin system, and the possibility that by blocking reuptake of these, these transmitters, you'd increase availability. So it was loosely based on this idea of, of deficiency, the mechanism of action having been dis identified in the 60s, receptors had become key targets for drug action. Selectivity was the objective of the day. This was a time when, when drug developers had identified individual receptors, you know, in relation to hypertension, in relation to uh, histamine in the, in, the, in the brain as well. They'd gone for selective drugs, which had had, uh, you know, rather, rather uh, useful effects on, on a variety of conditions, physical conditions. So receptors as key targets and subsequently selectivity as a key to a good clinical profile. And so in, in 1982, Zymeldine had been uh, given market access and fluoxetine or Prozac followed in 1986. So this is all part of the history lesson. You see what we can, we're building to. We have antidepressants that appear to work through serotonin facilitation. We have evidence that tryptophan is intimately involved in the disease. And so the idea becomes attractive that all these things can be linked together. Next slide, please. So the origins of the brain as a chemical machine, which incidentally links and curiously to psychedelics. The evidence that tryptophan was a precursor and when it was depleted, it produced depression. SSRIs were shown to be antidepressant and also anti-anxiety. And so the story could be told that depression was caused by low serotonin and could be treated by SSRIs. Now, this is a um, a beautiful, tidy hypothesis. You could communicate it to patients. It had some elements of truth about it. So what could possibly go wrong? My colleagues are now going to explain how wrong it's gone and how right it's gone since then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, guys. So I would now like to invite Samir. Um, I think we've, we've finished on quite an interesting topic of what could possibly go wrong. Um, so maybe if you'd now like to take to the floor and tell us what could what could actually go wrong, what followed? Um, oh, absolutely. That. And I'll bring it forward to recent debates, because I guess we're in the social media era, era where we hear about things first on Twitter or Facebook before we read it in the journals. So next slide, please. Thank you. It's my declarations of interest. I'm not Oscar Wilde, but nothing really in depression there. Next slide, please. These are some papers I think that you might find useful to read to just give you context for what I'm going to say. And uh, they cover recent debates. Paper with Phil Cohen covers the story of depression that Guy's illustrated over there. Next slide, please. So I was asked to cover recent debates and I guess taking things through from Guy, when Guy's finishing there in the mid nineties, I guess there's a song, isn't there? Things can only get better. And that's probably come full circle since then, in that the SSRIs were widely prescribed. You had that basis to them. And since then, what have we found? I guess clinically in terms of trials, you had STAR-D, which most would say was quite negative about 
uh, people's responses to SSRIs after a number of trials, and people finding in their clinical practice that these drugs were prescribed at a high level, and not everyone was getting a good response to them. In terms of the science, there are a number of studies in terms of neuroscience based on brain imaging, more tryptophan depletion studies, as well as gene environment studies, and I'll cover those. And I guess this was all epitomized very well, actually, about a year ago when the results of a review came out, and it was the most trending paper in PubMed, and it was one of the most trending news stories really for that week around the world. And uh, very rarely does that happen in psychiatry. And therefore, I've taken that review and used it as an example for us to really understand what's happened with serotonin since the, the halcyon days that Professor Goodwin's just described. So this was an umbrella review that came out in a very well-respected journal. We always say that when we publish in these journals, and it's molecular psychiatry. And it was called the Serotonin Theory of Depression, Systematic Umbrella Review of the Evidence. Next slide, please. So what's an umbrella review? You take systematic reviews and meta-analyses, take the studies out yourself and, and analyze them. So you can look at different areas. The authors looked at the role of serotonin and metabolites in the blood or CSF. They looked at brain imaging, so molecular imaging of the neurobiology, tryptophan depletion studies, which guys elucidated on, and gene association studies. Next slide, please. What else do they do in terms of the methodology? When you go through evidence, you have to grade quality. So they graded the quality of the evidence and they registered it beforehand so that people knew what they were doing. Next slide, please. And describing what they found. Well, they found no relationship between serotonin and metabolites in the body systems. Nick, and can you press the button? I think it comes up again. Thank you. And next, please. And they said they found a small change in regard to tryptophan depletion in people with illness, but nothing sp specific or special. Um, they found no findings in healthy volunteers. Next slide, please. And in the molecular imaging, they said essentially what they found was opposite to what one would expect. So they said that the receptors that you're looking at when you do the molecular imaging have been affected and they would expect the opposite to what people found. So when they did their review and they looked at the meta-analysis of molecular imaging of that receptor, they've had an opposite finding to what one would wish. Next slide, please. They then looked at the serotonin receptor in terms of brain imaging, found three reviews. Of those reviews, they said there were no consistent findings and therefore nothing to suggest a deficit of serotonin in the synapse. And they said this was consistent with findings of elevated serotonin, so not deficient serotonin. And they said, well, this is probably due to the effects of antidepressants. So in essence, what they're saying about the brain imaging is that the brain imaging is all opposite to what one would look to see. So next slide, please. So essentially the results were quite negative from this review. They looked at all the meta-analyses. They asked questions about brain imaging of the serotonin system. They asked questions about tryptophan depletion studies in people. They asked about serotonin in the blood and CSF and gene environment interactions. And what they've said is that there was no findings and the evidence would, would not support any role for serotonin and depression, which is a big question mark, isn't it? So going through the evidence, a number of us were, well, we all sort of sat and scratched our heads and went, well, have we, have we been missing something? So we went through the review. Well, firstly, it wasn't a conventional umbrella review. Uh, they didn't extract any of the original studies themselves. They just took the findings of the meta-analyses they seem to have come to different conclusions to the original authors, which was odd. Their reasoning for that was that these are overlapping studies, but most would say that, well, that's not really a reason. Next slide, please. 
And if you look at the criteria, so that was one of the big findings, was that they said there's very little certainty that serotonin is implicated in depression. Unfortunately, their criteria was quite arbitrary. They set the criteria themselves, essentially. And so if you set your own criteria for certainty, one could think it might be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, an example is that they said there were low sample sizes and therefore there's low certainty. As Guy's already said, it'd be ethically wrong to do huge samples of patients or repeat studies in this population. Next slide, please. So with the tryptophan depletion studies that they covered, and again, the best quality study showed a pretty clear effect. They said there's nothing there in healthy volunteers and small effect in patients. If you look at the effect size from the people whose meta-analysis, they actually quote, the effect size is huge for tryptophan depletion in patients. In fact, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Rui a couple of days ago, and we were just commenting on that effect size in regard to the patients. So the original authors of the meta-analyses said there was a huge effect in patients and people with depression. And I think that tinges on something that's going to be covered is that it's the sensitivity of some people to the effects of life stressors that will, or depression, really, that will cause these effects to come out. Next slide, please. Oh, what's a PET scanner? And how is it so complex? Can you press the button? And again, oh, we missed the animation, that's fine. The point being, PET scanning is quite complicated. When you're looking at tagging a receptor or an enzyme complex, you can only make comments about that one area. There are various machinations that go on and the interpretation is always in equipoise. Um, you can never be fully certain. So when you have a finding, saying it's either higher or lower doesn't really make sense. It's not the wheel of fortune. And when they were commenting, I think that's what came across. So for example, they said 5-HT1A receptor studies, it, the findings are opposite because it sits on the auto, it's mainly expressed presynaptically. It's not, it's expressed mainly postsynaptically. The point being, there's a degree of complexity there that the authors probably didn't cover in any depth. Next slide, please. And the same for the serotonin receptor studies. They said that the findings could be ascribed uh, to antidepressant medication. Actually, when you look, half the patients in the meta-analysis weren't taking antidepressant medicines. What's my point? My point is that the are consistent findings when you look at the individual meta-analyses of CERT. And we have to be honest and say, we don't quite know what's happening, but there is a finding there. And so it's opposite to what the author said. Next slide, please. And we wrote a response. If you think it's difficult to get academics to agree over a cup of coffee, try getting 36 of them to agree on a paper. And we wrote to the journal just illustrating all these points with some of the original authors of the meta-analyses. The main point was, if you're going to quote meta-analyses, it would be reasonable, I think, that what you say is the same as the authors of the original meta-analysis. Next slide, please. And we're a little bit short on time, so I'll finish soon. And then this went into the news, uh, which is unfortunate, but you can all read up on that. Next slide, please. And we gave podcasts, which I, I think were balanced and this it would be and be interesting just to see what happened from that. Next slide, please. They responded and then we responded. Next slide, please. And I think the crux of it were things like, well, the points, and I'll leave it to yourselves to read them. But they made points such as the main point of the tryptophan depletion studies to establish what happens in people in healthy volunteers. It's not. It's in people with depression that you see the effects. And that rings true to the original hypotheses. And the same with the finding of the 5-HT1A receptors. Next slide, please. They quoted a study when they responded to us. And if you read the original study, the authors of the original study say you can't extrapolate that to in vivo imaging. So again, quoting studies where the authors seem to say the opposite of what they wish. Next slide, please. So my conclusion I guess putting the evidence through there and seeing things over time, things are never going to be as simple as they were in the 60s. Well, life isn't as simple as it was in the 60s. But our experimental methods have been good. There have been replicated findings. 
And what their umbrella review showed to me at least was that if you use certain methodologies, you will come up with pretty much whatever you wish. And it requires scientific discipline and rigor, I think from people who've conducted the original research to just remind us all that we're not that intelligent. Mother Nature's a lot smarter than we think, and we just need to exercise a degree of humility. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Samir. Um, and if anybody has any questions for Samir or for Guy, please do put them in the Q&A and we will come back to them um, at the end after our next speakers. So moving on, um, I'm now going to introduce David. Um, David, if you'd like to do a bit more of a deeper dive for us into the clinical studies and um, show us what's what's actually going on in the brain. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure not to be speaking about psychedelics for once here. Um, left that to, to, to the guy part. Um, yeah, so I will dive a bit into a specific line of work that, that we have been involved in, in trying to uncover some of these brain mechanisms in depression using PET imaging. So if you take me to the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is jumping directly into the method. So the, the point here is that you can use PET imaging to assess not only receptor levels in the brain or the levels of transporters. So Samir was referring to uh, 1A, uh, serotonin 1A receptor imaging uh, um, results in depression and also to CERT, which is the transporter. All that you can label with highly specific uh, radioactively labeled compounds and, and, and quantify it with PET. But in addition to that, you can take a step more in the advanced direction of, of uh, using this method. And that is to assess the release of um, endogenous transmitters in the brain. The way to do that was sort of developed in the dopamine system. Um, uh, and um, the way it works is that you first do a scan where you uh, have the radio tracer marking and therefore able to quantify the receptor levels. Um, and in the dopamine scenario, it could be racket pride or pH and all that's just two, two, two traces that used in that system. If you then, after you have done your baseline scan, typically later in the day on another day, you then give a challenge to the brain that releases um, the transmitter, in this case, dopamine. So you can use amphetamine to release dopamine. Do uh, amphetamine, importantly, releases a lot of dopamine, but also quite a lot of serotonin and also noradrenaline. So it, it releases the monoamines. So when you do that with and you use a, a dopaminergic tracer, then you have a, a, a competition happening when you have released all this dopamine out in the synapse. And that works for the dopamine system. So if you use, then subtract the binding of the tracer between the two scans before and after the amphetamine, then you get an indirect measure here of the release of dopamine. So that was developed and worked well in the dopamine system. It worked even better when you replaced an antagonist radio tracer with an agonist because it seemed to compete better with the endogenous uh, dopamine. So um, that then that thinking has then been attempted to be transferred to the serotonin system, where decades uh, of efforts have been. You know, it, it, the field has been struggling to find a method that could measure serotonin release in the brain. Because as you, you heard, a lot of the evidence for an involvement of serotonin in depression is very indirect. Um, it has to do with tryptophan depletion and so on. But what about actually imaging, quantifying the, the transmitter release in the brain? That would be a step much, much closer, more direct evidence. And therefore, it has been a big, on the agenda, um, a big um, priority to try to transfer some of the knowledge and method development from other transmitter systems to the serotonin system. The, the, the issue is it's about finding the right tracer combined with the right pharmacological challenge to apply to the model. So if you take me to the next slide, please. And this next slide is a bit like a lot of stuff. So I will just basically say here, don't need to, to go into too much detail. A lot has been tested. A lot has been tried. So a different kind of tracers, some uh, 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 targeting the CERT, 1A, 1B, 2A, uh, 5 4 all these different traces that hit these targets and can quantify them have been tried in combination with a range of different um, challenges, but it has not really worked. So it hasn't really been able to displace that tracer and therefore have this indirect measure of the release. That's the short version of the story. Uh, and it might be because um, the tracer is not sensitive enough and, and it's not easy enough to compete with it on the target, on the receptors. 
or, or transporters. And then maybe also because the challenge, the pharmacological challenge have been too weak. For instance, uh, as one example, you can see on the uh, bottom middle part, you can see that at, at a very potent releaser like fenfluramine releases a lot of serotonin, so it might be more um, appealing to use than, for instance, the telopram and SSRI that releases a, a lot less. So you need to have a powerful re uh, releaser and a sensitive tracer. So if you take me to the next slide. So the knowledge from dopamine was that the agonist were better. Therefore, uh, in Copenhagen, where I'm originally from, there was this move towards trying to develop and test and validate a agonist PET tracer in the serotonin system. And the target we chose, or they chose, was the 2A receptor, because we already used um, uh, that system a lot. And, and th this is where the talk becomes a tiny bit psychedelic, because an agonist for the 2A actually is a psychedelic. So the tracer that ended up being developed called SIMPI-36, and as you see to the to the left, um, that is a serotonin 2A receptor agonist PET tracer. So, so that had the agonist quality, so that's a good start. And th there was a lot of different, by the way, um, attempts to develop it. There. That's why it's called number 36. But this one had the best profile as a PET tracer among all these different candidates. So therefore, we then had uh, wanted to test whether it could be sensitive to release, and we did that using amphetamine. And the reason why for that, you could also have used MDMA, you could have used fenfluramine, but amphetamine is a very reliable um, pharmacological challenge in these studies, and it does release quite a lot of um, serotonin. So the dopamine release doesn't really matter because the SIMPI tracer is not sensitive at all to uh, um, at, at, at dopamine changes. So therefore, if we go to the next slide, then the, the setup is a bit like explained before. You do a baseline, and you also have an MRI in order to be able to extract the uh, anatomical information from the PET. Then you give your, in this case, oral dexamphetamine, and then three hours later, you do your second PET scan, and then you subtract them. And, and, and the outcome measure is called delta B, P, and D, which is basically a measure of the serotonin release capacity, which is sort of the binding of the, the this agonist tracer before and after. Um, and we did that in, in 17 healthy volunteers, and we added later on three females um, to the to the data set. And what we saw there was a significant release, if you go to the next slide. Thank you. So you can see here that the binding drops, and that's because of the competition of the release serotonin. And um, that's at least the, the model uh, and the explanation that you see then a, a reduced binding, which is a, a measure of the release. And you can see there around 14% cortical areas uh, decrease in the binding. So a measure of the serotonin release capacity. So suddenly we had a method using an agonist tracer and a fediment challenge that worked in these healthy people. So that was an important first step. If you go to the next slide, then the logical thing is then to apply it in depression, which we did to 17 patients with depression, um, both genders. Uh, more male than female, which was also the case in the uh, healthy uh, studies before that. Um, five of them had Parkinson and major depressive episode, and, and 12 of them just major depressive episode. Um, um, and then we, we had the 20 controls, so the 17 from 4 plus 3 added a female participant to balance the groups better. So if we go to the next slide, and it was the same methodology, of course, um, when we looked at those results, they were published, as you can see here, we see a reduction of the release capacity of, of serotonin among the patients compared to the controls. So here we have a method um, developed and applied in depression that takes the molecular attempt to assess this in the brain a bit closer um, and, and a bit more direct because suddenly we actually have a method that can be used to assess serotonin release capacity, and we see a reduction of that, which is in the direction of the serotonin hypothesis of um, sort of deficiency in the monoamine transmission. So weirdly enough, this paper, obviously we had not, we didn't do this study just to show that they were wrong in the molecular psychiatry review. This pay, this work was going on for years, actually, uh, before they probably even start uh, pre-registering their review. But it came out at a funny time um, because of, of this whole uh, heated debate about the involvement of serotonin and the, 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 the questionable serotonin hypothesis. So, so our data sort of went in a bit the other 
opposite direction from this uh, molecular psychiatry review, which also is mentioned then in, in some of the uh, discussions later on between those authors and, and all those authors that you saw semi listing, including myself. So if you go to the next slide, we didn't, we, a logical thing to try to use this method for is to start treating people at the time where you do the scan, just after these scans, and then see whether your response to SSRI treatment would be related to your serotonin release capacity. So the hypothesis would very logically be that if you're bad at releasing serotonin, then it would help you taking an SSRI. But what if you are in the same levels as healthy in the normal range of release, then it might be that your depression is more related to other transmitter systems, for instance, or other factors, and therefore it might not work. So this is a logical thing to look at. This is very preliminary. We only had six people we could look at in this sample, and we didn't see any effect in this small sample. So um, if you go to the next slide, that probably is the last one. Yep, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much, David. It's a fascinating insight into the, the clinical angle as well. So next, last but not least, we have our final speaker, Beata, um, who is joining us to talk about the um the pharmacology of this and how do we how do we translate everything that we've heard today into developing new treatments um, and antidepressants. So take it away, Beata. Thank you. Right, thank you very much for having me. I would like to talk today about the mechanisms of action of antidepressants with a focus on serotonin to feed this uh, this talk, set of talks bet better. Uh, I, I will start from saying that uh, I have to discuss things with Samir because he mentioned that study is seen as a negative proof for the action of, the, of antidepressants. I actually personally see it as a wonderful proof that people actually respond to antidepressants. And what it shows is that there is like one, about one third that don't respond, but that only means that we don't know uh, everything about depression and its causes, but we know a lot and we can help a lot of people. So I think two thirds is quite a lot some year. <laughs> uh, right, next slide. Quite a lot of uh, antidepressants, they act through serotonergic mechanisms. And I am showing this uh, in theory, very complex slides, but what it shows uh, really that the majority of antidepressants in one way or another, they are acting through serotonergic mechanisms. So if you look at the sort of bluish color, it shows all the drugs that act through uh, blocking serotonin transporters or acting on the receptors, be it postsynaptic or presynaptic, or stopping the breakdown of serotonin. Next slide, please. Uh, focusing uh, a little bit, so doing a close up, we've got drugs that uh, inhibit reuptake of uh, serotonin, such as very well known SSRIs, uh, for example, sertraline, fluoxetine, uh, citalopram. The drugs that are a little bit more complex and that they uh, encompass also block it of other receptors. Drugs that not only block the transported, but also go for specific receptors. So as, as Guy mentioned, there was a lot of research into very specific actions of certain uh, medications. Uh, so uh, this the action is very complex. Uh, please, next slide. The action is very complex, but how we can understand uh, what actually giving a drug means for the brain and means for us. There's a lot of ways, a lot of levels at which we can look. So biologically, we can look at the very molecular level, starting from DNA and RNA. So what changes in the production of mRNA uh, when we give people antidepressants? What uh, changes in, uh, within certain pathways, for example, pathways leading to an increased production of trophic factors, including BDNF, with increased pl plasticity that is quite clearly seen after, uh, after uh, implementation of SSRIs. And we can also look at the level of the brain, uh, paying particular attention to the network of structures that are, are implicated in the processing of emotionally salient information. And I will focus on this particular area, which is also the main area of our research into antidepressants. Next slide. Uh, this is a very nice place to mention that uh, finally psychiatry and psychology merge and marry after many, many decades of uh, apparently divide. Now we use them together and use the tools that and, and notions, concept devised by psychology to actually understand what happens in the brain of people with certain uh, psychiatric disorders, including depression, 
and how we can better understand the mechanism of uh, the action of antidepressants. So I just want to mention one concept from psychology, so called negative bias in emotional processing, which very much means that people with depression, uh, they see the world uh, in, a, in sort of dark goggles, and they see everything as darker than it is, they are prone to negative interpretation of events, and this is a very well known phenomenon. It can be tested in the lab, luckily, and uh, we use those methods to actually to understand what happens in the brain as well. So one of the tasks that we quite commonly used, if you look at those fascia, they, they express emotions. And the brain and us uh, and our emotions, we are very prone to respond to faces because they are a very important social uh, communication tool. So we use them, we show them in the scanner, and then we look at the brain and see what happens in the brain. For example, comparing people with depression, people without depression, so that we can understand the mechanisms of depression, but also we use those faces to understand what happens when we give people antidepressants. Uh, and just very, uh, very briefly, uh, and in a very simplistic way, I will mention that in the, in the brain, what happens in depression, is the imbalance between the two main systems. So one is the one that includes the amygdala, the insula, the anterior cingulate cortex. And this system is uh, designed to very promptly uh, respond to emotionally salient inf information in the unconscious rapid way without any conscious thought going into it. DLPFC, so this sort of higher system uh, involved in thinking uh, and uh, decision making, it's supposed to control those responses. In depression, that goes wrong, and uh, this, let's say, lower system is a bit more responsive, it reacts too much to things that seem to be threatening, and DLPFC is not able to control it. So that's depression. And uh, what we would expect, if this is such an important concept for depression and key feature for depression, is that antidepressants would actually correct it. So the next slide. And that was actually uh, very nicely shown over the past two decades uh, in, in brain studies in which people with depression were put in the scanner, they had their brain scanned by watching emotional faces. And it was quite clearly seen that over the time of treatment, the reactivity of the amygdala and some other structures that are important for this emotional salient information processing, it would go back to the baseline. So it will, would go back to the level uh, that we would expect of the healthy brain. Uh, so that's great. But after eight weeks of treatments, a lot of people would have gone already to respond to medications. So it wasn't very clear what was first, mood or was it the change in this negative bias represented by the action of the brain? Uh, and this is quite an important question when we try to understand the mechanisms of antidepressants. So next slide. So Kat Harmer's group has uh, dedicated, uh, they, they, they dedicated themselves to, to this task of understanding what actually happens in the very early days of treatment and what, what, what it actually means for the response to antidepressants. And uh, it was really intriguing to see that uh, a short treatment already, a treatment of seven days or even just one dose of citalopram and SSRI, it actually creates this effect on the brain. So people, even after one dose, their amygdala goes back to the level of response that we would expect of healthy people. And that was also seen in a laboratory task uh, with decreased attentional vigilance to negative uh, stimuli or with more correct uh, allocation of, uh, of emotional labels to the faces. So this bias towards negative information was disappearing both in our sort of everyday experience expressed by lab experiments and also in the brain. Then next slide, please. Uh, so that those healthy volunteer studies, uh, but what is really important for clinicians and for patients is really what happens in the brain that is depressed. So if this negative bias correction is important for the response to, to, uh, to antidepressants in general, in particular SSRIs and other ser serotonergic drugs, is that we would expect uh, that what happens in early days would allow prediction of treatment response uh, after uh, the expected clinically time. And also we would expect that this happens without the change in mood. Next slide. 
So we, we've done uh, a few studies in people with depression, and this one study was very interesting. So what we did, we, we had people with depression who were scanned twice before we started treatment with an SSRI acetalopram and after seven days of treatment, so early days. And then we assessed them again after six weeks. After six weeks, we could see the clear divide into responders and non-responders, so green and blue bars. But this divide was not seen after seven days of treatment. While after seven days of treatment, we could already see a change at the brain level. So the structures that, again, are involved in the processing of emotionally salient information, uh, they went back to, uh, to the sort of level comparable to uh, healthy people. Uh, and they involve structure like the amygdala, the insula, the ACC. So we would, what we actually see as dysfunctional in depression. Uh, right, next slide. Uh, we also we were interested in seeing whether actually the baseline activity of the brain, how much it can tell us about the antidepressant effect. And we could actually see that this baseline activation, again, to emotional faces, so threatening faces and happy faces, it was predictive of response to treatment. It was, then with, it was seen with moderate accuracy, so allocation, correct allocation of response uh, group was at the level of 72%, so it wasn't perfect, but it's actually quite promising. And it was seen in the anterior cingulate cortex, which, which is one of the known markers of response to antidepressant, but also across the other structures like paracingulate, uh, basal ganglia, or thalamus. Next slide, please. Uh, another level of looking at how antidepressants work is actually through the networks in the brain. So one structure is just one structure, but actually the brain, it is a network. And it seems that antidepressants affect the networks, not just sing singular structures. So how we did it, we, we assessed resting state function and connectivity, uh, which is assessed in the scanner when people don't do anything at all, they just sort of let the mind flow. Uh, and we could see that the greater pretreatment functional connectivity between two important networks, so called from the parietal network and default mode network, uh, was predictive of a better treatment response, which again tells us that the better control through executive function, so uh, from the parietal network over the network that seems to be more active in depression, is very important for the mechanism of action of, of antidepressants. Okay, next slide. There's always a question whether it all could be just down to a placebo effect. And we think not. Uh, we did another study in which people were given again for seven days uh, a, cytolop a cytolopram or placebo. They were exposed again to the same task of fearful and happy uh, faces. And after seven days, there was not much difference in terms of response, uh, but we could see a uh, clinical response but we could very clearly see that only people who were given a cytalopram, uh, the level of their activation in the amygdala went back to the level similar to healthy controls. While people on placebo, so people depressed, not treated, they were, uh, their amygdala was still overactive. So we exclude the effect of placebo uh, to a significant uh, level. Uh, next slide. Now, how we can put it all together? So all those findings, they created the basis for the cognitive neuropsychological theory. That also explains one interesting thing about the mechanism of action of antidepressants. So there is this known phenomenon of the delayed clinical onset. Uh, so the onset is actually not that, uh, that uh, uh, delayed, but the clinically significant uh, results, they show up after four to, seven to six weeks. And the idea is that actually changes at the brain level, bio biological effects with mRNA, with uh, plasticity, they happen quite quickly. The same, they change in bias, in emotional bias. But what needs to happen is the, sh is the learning process effectively. So people have to put this newly created, more positive bias in the positive environment. And that will, will lead to clinically significant mood change. I will just mention, because it would be a bit unfair to dismiss one uh, biological effect that can explain the delayed clinical onset of, of those typical, uh, including serotonergic antidepressants. Uh, the autoreceptor 5-HT1A autoreceptor was mentioned. And one idea is that when we have too much serotonin, 
uh, through the action of antidepressants, then our body says it's too much. We have to stop producing it because something is not quite right. And this happens through those other receptors that need time to downregulate and for the new balance to find place. So the increase in serotonin effectively can take action. Next slide. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, the change in bias needs positive social interactions and uh, more studies are needed about this, but there was one study showing that actually only people who perceived their level of support as positive, only in those people, the change in bias uh, in the early days was predictive of response to treatment. And that was also mentioned before in this talk, to the importance of social interactions as one of the possible reasons why in some people medications, including SSRIs and other serotonergic drugs may have a limited effect. So that's, that it's quite nicely. Next slide. Just to say, oh, there should be a slide saying thank you very much. Thank you, Beata. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, let me bring you all back up on screen. Let's see if I can do that. Um, Okay, Guy, bring you back. While I'm doing this, Guy, let's kick off with a question to you. Um, what does all of this have to do with psychedelics? <laughs> well, as I tried to show, I, in a sort of a way, psychedelics kicked off the serotonin story and um, the idea that the the drugs and the, the drugs acted in the brain and that the brain was in some ways deficient of serotonin when people had mental illness so it kicked them it kicked off that story um it's gone full circle in that having now spent you know a number of decades without access to these medicines legally uh, we're now we now seem to be embarking on the the right path to restore them if if we can complete the right studies um, for regulatory purposes to make a number of different uh, drugs with serotonergic agonist properties available and I suppose all I would reflect is that this brings serotonin right to the fore of the treatment <coughs> um, potential in uh, depression, because these these drugs, for the most part, really operate only on serotonergic receptors and they they clearly activate the serotonergic system. So there's absolutely no doubt they're centrally involved. Um, and so far, they look to be more effective in the more difficult to treat conditions which again argues for this very centrality of serotonin. So I don't have any, I never really had too many doubts about the, the central role of serotonin in the treatments. Of course, that's not the same as saying that it's central in the disease. And the problem is we don't really understand the disease that well. But part of what we can start to do through the methods that, um, that David described is to try and do the specific probing that has to be done to make that case. And a, because the thing is that that basically it's very hard to study the brain uh, when in an intact, uh, living, breathing human being, and that that has always limited our field. So yeah. that's the way I see things. I think we definitely have a treatment story. The illness story is still being developed, but it's an interesting one. Um, and so I'm just looking at the Q and A, and we've actually got several questions on the same theme here, which is really around the theme of personalized medicine. So we've got a lot of um, evidence that you've suggested that some responded, some didn't. Um, some of our delegates have, have picked up on the fact that there's um, high variability in treatment response and tolerance of different um, current medicines. So I wondered whether, does anybody want to come in on um, on the topic of what, what we can do and, and what is the role of the serotonin system in, in what we currently know and, and where we can go with the future of treatment for more personalized approaches to the treatment of mental health conditions. I have a, a comment on it, if, if that's okay. So, so as I also mentioned, we, um, at, by the way, Beata was heavily involved in, in the study and, and uh, mm -hmm. helped recruit basically all the patients for the studies. Um, and uh, what we did, and I think actually probably was Beata starting them up on the SSRIs. The whole point of that is actually quite important because that is the attempt first step to try to do that to immediately try to exploit a method that it can actually measure some of these things more directly in the living human brain and then see whether you can use that to to see whether it predicts response so we can measure release of serotonin we uh, as with this method we can measure dopamine we can measure 
uh, GABA, we can measure in dolphins. So if you replace the traces with traces in, uh, for the other systems, we can measure quite a lot now. The issue is that if you really wanted to do the ultimate study, it would be a massive cohort of people who are not yet started treatment for depression. Then you would actually scan them with all these different scans, all of them. That would be the beauty. So you can have their release of this uh, 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 transmitter, that transmitter, and then start treating them and then maybe cross over and start with another one if they don't respond and then start having this beautiful overview of who responds to what and how that relates back to the brain chemistry. That is very biological thinking that is totally meaningful to try to do with these methods. The issue is that they're very invasive, they're extremely expensive, it costs around 30K to do one participant because of two scans. So so, so that makes it very difficult. We are applying right now to the MRC to, to repeat the whole replicated with the more selective release of fenfluramin to see whether we can do that. And then we would start treating and look at treatment response. But you could do that in parallel with all the different me meshes. That would be very logical. Then you might want to look for surrogate markers mm -hmm. with other imaging methods, such as MRI, some of what Breata is using, emotional faces, to see how that relates to the PET measure, and then start applying that instead, because that would obviously be better. Then you link it back molecularly with the PET. But um, yeah, anyway, I'll stop here. But definitely mm -hmm. very important questions. So we'll come to you, Beata and then Samir for quick comments, and then hopefully we'll try and squeeze in one more question. So Beata on this one. And there, there are actually quite studies attempting just that. Uh, so studies looking into differences between particular medications or groups of medications like SSRIs and SLRIs. And they showed some differences in how brain responds to uh, to different, uh, as we use emotional faces. So some will be responding to making a change to how people process happy emotions. Some will be showing like changes in like how people process fear. And we could see certain different certain differences in patterns in people who would go on to respond to certain groups of medications. The problem is, as David said, that those are single studies, so we don't know how well they would replicate and how reliably we can use them in the clinic. So they are not yet usable as such, but there are some uh, first signs of uh, that this this might be possible. Plus, uh, as, as David also said, we've got those surrogate markers that are those simple tasks that can be done in the lab. So we, we make people actually look at the emotional faces or other tasks and see what are the differences and patterns of response in those who respond to, say, again, SSRIs or SNRIs or other medications, whether they are different or whether we could predict based on this who should be on which medication, which we kind of solved what STARD should be, try to do. The people had to wait three months to change their medication to another one and then another one and some would respond to this last uh, lack of treatments. And this is really what happens in the clinic, that we it's a little bit like we are trying what works for most, we think, and we try next medications. So this is happening, definitely. There's a lot of thought going into it. Thank you. So may I have comment on that one? Uh, yeah, nothing much to add. You just have to be able to link the epidemiological data, the clinical data, the biological, and then take advantage of things like the fact that, you know, the kids these days have got all these apps. They're measuring so many different things. And it's integrating all those data systems together. That has to be the future. Um, and it will happen. That's a prediction. I just don't know when. So just one last question that we've got time for in the last two minutes um, is around the um, the linking of different disciplines. So someone has, has posted a question highlighting the similarities between Parkinson's um, and the, the depletion story there. Um, is there anything that we can learn from other areas of neuroscience that we should be applying um, here? Well, Parkinson's is a good example for the dopamine story, and we've used it in schizophrenia. And I guess it's also using the other techniques we've used in other areas of psychiatry, like David was saying there, with the challenge story. And what was beautiful about your stuff, David, is that's a you know that's a journey over time taking things that we knew from the mid nineties and following them through and actually finding an answer at the end. It's quite a positive way to end things on, I think. Well, we'll, we'll take that positive comment and, and leave it there for now, we'll leave on a high. Um, thank you so much to Beata, Samir, Guy and David for giving such excellent talks today. I thank you for your time and for such stimulating discussions. Um, thank you so much to our participants for joining us. The recording will be available online so you can watch this back later.
Um, thank you very much and see you soon. Bye now.